Music.com. Welcome to the music space. Thanks. Our special guest today is Cheryl Page from Florida. She's a singer, songwriter, guitarist. Say hi, Cheryl. Hey, how are you? Good. So, basically, our topic of the day today is going to be uh, capo tunings. Obviously, you're using uh, a capo there, Cheryl. Right. And you have you have a, a different tuning as well. I. I think. Yeah, it, I'm actually, it's standard tuning and I'm just using capos to accomplish different kinds of tunings without okay. having to change my strings. Okay, can you elaborate more on that? What, what sort of tuning do you have at the moment? Just a regular? Yeah, so this is standard tuning, then I take a standard capo, this is a, a Kaiser capo, and I'm placing it at the second fret from the fourth through the six strings, so I get, which is actually, let's see, it would be uh, an F sharp, B, E, A, B, and E. So, so you get some nice dissonances, you just play a standard chord shape. What's that? So you leave the B and E string open. And yeah, the B and E string are open and everything else is capoed at the second fret. Okay, and you could, you could use that pretty much anywhere up the neck too in the same... Yeah, you can. You can move it all over the place. So uh, I've got a bunch of different tunings that I do with a single capo or with multi, multiple capos. So that's, right. that's one. So... Uh, Just get nice different chord sounds from it. That's great. And obviously you, you could use it the other way around. I, I imagine you could put the capo on the bottom and have the you know, e, perhaps e yeah, and a. Yeah, you can do the same thing. Yep, you can play um, you know, the same way and uh, grab sort of like an interesting, uh, sort of like a drop D. Some chords work better than others, but yeah. what I what I find tends to work the best is to use a uh, capo on the four strings from fourth to sixth. That tends to work really well. Um, another one that works really well is if you use a, a half capo, which has the cutout for the E string. Um, you can place that pretty much on any even numbered fret. And you can play above and below the capo, so you can. Then you can play at the capo. You know, I get some nice. things and you know of yeah. course if you play it down here you've got your standard drop D tuning so that was a half capo you said Cheryl is it? yeah it's a half capo so it only it only touches three strings 
Um, okay. Kaiser makes one. Uh, there's a few different manufacturers that make them. But um, right now, I've got it. And you, could, you could use it on your mandolin as well. <laughs> yeah, you probably could. So, uh, but uh, it, it might be a little bit too thick, you know, for a mandolin yeah. neck. But, um, yeah, so I've got it on the fourth, uh, fourth, fifth, third, fourth, and fifth strings here. So you get that nice, you know, you get the E string, and then you're up here at the, you get a C sharp, an F sharp, a B, and another B. So you get a double B, and then an E. And then you just play your normal chords. And what I love about the capo tunings is that you don't have to learn a bunch of new chord shapes. You can just play your normal chord shapes and like it doesn't even sound like I'm using a half capo here. It sounds like a regular uh, G shape. But I can take take a finger off and all of a sudden I have that open string and I get kind of a nice added note in there. I just yeah. love the sound of a chord with just a little bit of dissonance in it. Yeah. It's a good way to find inspiration for, for writing tunes as well, stumbling upon a new sound. Yeah, which is always absolutely. The first, first step of a musician being inspired to write something new. Yeah. So, yeah. So Cheryl, let's talk a little bit about um, your life in music. Okay. Um, it basically started with your aunt finding a guitar. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I was a kid, and my mom and I were visiting my aunt in her apartment in Costa Mesa, California. And outside, they have these big bins or you know dumpsters and. Uh, where people would take their trash and leave it and somebody had taken a guitar they had spray painted it black and tossed it in the bin and so as I was leaving the apartment with my mom and my aunt uh, my aunt looked over and happened to see this guitar and she and my mom fished it out and took a look at it just to see is this thing in any condition to be used and uh, they determined that it was actually a pretty good guitar and so uh, my mom uh, stripped off all the black paint and refinished it put fresh strings on it and taught me the three chords that she knew and uh, that's how I started to learn to play guitar. Great and you, you were shy at first. Um, yeah. And you didn't yeah. like performing live. How did you get into sort of playing for your school and the church and in the community? You know, I just had to kind of get over being really shy. I would sit in my room and play for four hours at a time. I love to play guitar. And uh, so even when I was working on schoolwork, I would do like a half hour's worth of homework, and then I would play guitar for an hour. And then I would say, oh, i got to get my homework done. So I'd do another half hour's worth of homework, and then I'd play guitar for two hours. And uh, so I just played constantly, and I had friends who were also musicians. And we just liked to jam with each other. And eventually we started playing at uh, different things for school. We started writing music together and uh, playing for different school functions and uh We'd go and perform. Out. We lived really close to the ocean, so we'd go open our guitar cases on the pier and play music for an hour or two, collect enough money to go out and buy a nice dinner, and we'd go out and buy a nice dinner and then go home. You know, so it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. Great. Do you still consider yourself shy when it comes to performing? You know, I, I think I'm over the real shyness. I don't get super nervous when I'm performing anymore, so uh, that's great. I always have a lot of, you know, energy. The, the excitement of getting to interact with an audience is, is really exhilarating, and so I get a lot of energy from that, for sure. Yeah, so, but I don't so get experience. nervous. Yeah. yeah, so the experience makes you more confident. Yeah, um, absolutely. You focus more on the music rather than the who's listening and yeah 
So eventually your best friend in college uh, helped um, helped you produce uh, your first CD, is that correct? Yeah, it is. Um, I had been playing music all through college and doing uh, a lot of events at college and uh, my friend got together with a bunch of other people that we knew and they kind of took up a collection and said, you really need to go record these songs that you've been writing. So uh, they came up with enough money for me to do my first recording and I went to a studio in San Pedro, California and uh, showed my songs to the producer there and he loved them and he said, I've got just the band to play with you and he brought in a keyboard player who I met for the first time in our first recording session and he, uh, I ended up marrying him eventually. <laughs> So uh, okay. I got more than a recording out of that deal. It was pretty good. But the, the story goes that they never actually paid him, so I've been paying him back the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, that's, that's wonderful when you have a, you know, you can have a musical rapport with somebody that obviously develops into something a lot more. Yeah. Deep. That's fantastic. Um, and then you got some some gigs working for uh, or writing for some local bands, uh, Malcolm and the Mirrors? Is yeah, so or... Malcolm and the Mirrors, they were uh, in the kind of the Christian rock scene in the early, late 70s, early 80s, uh, and they were signed with Word Records, and uh, I just happened to be in the same area, and they liked my writing and my music, and so they would do jam sessions to write and the band would get together and come up with these recordings of just a band jam and they would bring the recordings to me and say see what you can do with this and I would write a melody and lyrics to to the jam that they had come up with and then uh, I would hand that off to their lead singer uh, Malcolm Wilde and then he and I would kind of finesse the lyrics so that they sounded more authentic coming from him and uh, so, you know, I got to write with them uh, on a couple of their albums. So that was a lot of fun. Great. And what, what sort of stuff has inspired you, Cheryl? I mean, I, what I heard you play there in the beginning, I, I got little little snippets of Joni Mitchell, that sort of thing. Is that is that a fair...? Yeah, yeah I think I, I grew up listening to people like Joni Mitchell and James Taylor and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, some of the progressive rock bands like Yes. Um, and then, um, you know, later on, I was, I really loved the guitar work of uh, The Police, you know, I just loved uh, Andy Summers' guitar work and uh, just, I love the way he kind of used uh, added notes to create some really interesting sounds and, and that, again, that dissonance that I love so much. So, um, you know, and, and really all of Sting's music going forward where he was bringing in some different elements of jazz, I just think is fantastic. And um, I don't know, I just listen to lots of different music and uh, I try to learn from everything that I listen to. And so when I listen, I'll, I can listen to the same song maybe a hundred times and hear something different every time I'm listening. I might be focusing on the bass line or some little element that comes in once and then disappears and never comes back. And I think, you know, why did the arranger and producer architect it that way? So I'm, I'm constantly listening and analyzing. Yeah, that's great. Um, you also had your own band, uh, Liaisons. Yeah. Uh, toured the UK and the US. Yeah, yeah, we were in the UK and the US, and we were a rock band primarily. We did, uh, we had, our composition was a synthesizer, uh, synth bass, um, and then we had uh, electric guitar, which I played, and uh, one of the other girls in the band played acoustic guitar, and um, and then we had a wild and crazy drummer. So, and he was a lot of fun. And the drummer and my husband, who was on keyboards, uh, they're both pretty funny guys. So they would get these really interesting comedic things going between the, the two of them in live performance, which was always a lot of fun. Fantastic. 
And obviously you married the keyboard player. Mm, I did. How did that sort of affect, and then you had had a family with him, how did uh -huh. that uh, affect your touring and your musical career? You know, uh, it, it kind of got to the place where I would do long distance touring uh, maybe like once a year and then the rest of the time I would just do what I would call like a drive-by, you know, where I could just drive somewhere and back in a day. And uh, very often I would take my daughter with me. She toured with me from the time she was about eight months old. And so just part of the gig was that uh, when I went on tour, every place I played, um, which are typically family-friendly places, um, like listening rooms and churches and, and places like that, um, somebody would be there who would just help watch my daughter. And so she got to experience a whole lot of different places in the country and got to meet a bunch of different people. And because of that, she's a much more, uh, I don't know, open kind of a person just really uh, interested in meeting other people and understanding what they're all about. So it was a good thing. Yeah. Is she a musician herself, Cheryl? She is actually, uh, she's more in the visual arts. So I think with two okay. parents that are musicians, she wanted to branch out and do something a little bit different. She does play a little keyboard, but, um, you know, primarily she's a visual artist. Fantastic. So, um, with your um, touring life, is there any tips you could perhaps give anyone watching about how to manage a family and and a musical career, which obviously a, a lot of musicians aren't very good at? <laughs> I think, you know, uh, we just sort of made it a part of our life together. And so uh, there was never... A, there's never that sense of it's either family or music. It was just music was part of the family. And so um, we all just kind of hung in there together and, and did things together. And, you know, we just learned how to be flexible as much as possible. So, you know, we tried carefully not to plan things around times that we knew were going to be, um, you know, critical family times. Um, mm -hmm. And then, but, you know, the rest of the time we just had fun. It was kind of like permanent vacation and getting to see different parts of the world, really, as a family. And, uh, you know, music will attract people into your uh, sphere that uh, you wouldn't normally, as just a normal tourist, have the opportunity to meet. So uh, when my daughter was in Japan a couple of years ago, um, we went over and I didn't actually bring my guitar with me. I just would go into a music store and uh, play guitar in the music store and, and things like that. But um, just the fact that we were musicians uh, opened up a lot of introductions to people that otherwise we wouldn't have had. So it was fantastic. Great. And during about 15 years you uh, were touring, you recorded four albums. And uh -huh. uh, a local TV show called Session 31. Uh huh. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, I got really interested in the creative process of, of musicians and songwriters in particular. Um, I really wanted to understand from different people um, how they actually did what they did and why they did what they did. So we interviewed musicians in their creative process and, and got them to articulate that for us. And so we had just some great local and regional touring musicians and some national musicians on the show. Um, and uh, I think probably the most famous person we had on the show was Denny Doherty from the Mamas and Papas. Oh. And, uh, you know, he had a really interesting perspective, you know, we, we just asked him, uh, you know, in the 30-some years you've been doing music, what's changed? And he says, well, nothing for me, I just stand behind the microphone and sing, <laughs> you know? yeah. which I thought was like a really important comment because, you know, the creating music, you know, uh, being able to articulate that artistic vision that you have inside and then also being able to uh, connect with people, that remains the same regardless of the technology. 
So, you know, I think as a musician, uh, what I try to advise people to do is, uh, you know, make sure that you got something inside worth sharing. You know, make sure that you're constantly feeding yourself uh, artistically so that when you want to say something musically, you really have something to say and can connect with people with. Yeah, that's great. I think, uh, sadly, uh, Dini is his name, passed away a few years ago, is that correct? Yes, he did, yes. The song, the song, he was the songwriter, wasn't he? He was a singer. I think he did some songwriting in the band as well. Yeah, and he had just recently released a, a bunch of music in Japan, as a matter of fact. But, um, okay. yeah, he was great. Really, yeah. really yeah. genuinely nice man. Yeah, and you yourself uh, recorded four albums. Are they all your albums or just what you were collaborating on? Or? Um, most of them were things that I wrote on my own. Um, I don't think I've got too many collaborative songs on there, but the next project that I'm doing, I intend to be much more collaborative uh, just because it's so fun to get together with other musicians and really... Uh, you know, when you're working together, they may have an idea about where the music should go or how it should go, or they may bring something entirely different to the table than you have on your own. And so, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Great. So on a, on a more somber note, um, Cheryl, you, um, in 2008, you were diagnosed with cancer. Uh -huh. That obviously changed your life quite dramatically. Yeah, it um, did. Can you tell us some more about that. Yeah, so I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and uh, I went through six months of <clears throat> chemotherapy for that. And uh, <clears throat> during that time, um, I was just surrounded by uh, friends and musicians um, who just, they would come over, like one of my friends is a, really into blues, so he came over and played Robert Johnson and just sat with me for like hours and played Robert Johnson music and so I got to listen to that and uh, and others would just sit and hang out with me and talk and I got to connect with people in a really kind of an intimate way during uh, during that time um, and it just gave me a, a real appreciation for the people in my life and it also uh, really gave me an appreciation for just time and, and how uh, a lot of times people will say, oh, when I reach this milestone, I'll do this or that. Uh, but it, it made me realize that, you know, time is precious and uh, you should just, if there's something you want to do, you should take the necessary actions and means to go out and do it. So, like, don't wait until you're, you know, retired or whatever to pick up that instrument. It's like carve out, even if it's just 15 minutes a day, carve out 15 minutes a day and play music. Uh, you know, don't wait till you're, uh, you know, till you're retired or whatever to go on tour, you know. Plan a little tour, even if you're just going to perform at open mics in an area. Just go perform in every open mic you can in an area and go meet other people and find out what they respond to that you play or find out what you really like that you may have never heard before. So uh, it was a it was actually a really uh, great time in my life, you know, to come out the other side of it and I'm healthy and, uh, you know, I've beat it. So I'm, I'm very thankful. Fantastic. Good on you, Cheryl. Um, a lot of the proceeds or part of the proceeds of uh, your albums uh, have gone towards um, charities, uh, uh, as in cancer that you have um, beaten yourself. Mm -hmm. you're, um, you're contributing towards the charities to help people that are suffering, is that correct? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of different organizations that I've uh, been involved with to help raise funds and uh, one of them is uh, the Space Coast Cancer Foundation which helps, um, it, it pays for medical treatment for people who uh, don't have medical insurance or the means to pay for treatment themselves, uh, which I think is, is really fantastic. 
And then um, I've also done some work with an organization called Mama Palooza, and uh, they actually raise money to uh, to help promote women in the arts who wouldn't otherwise uh, have the ability to be promoted. Uh, it, it tends to be, I don't know if it's that way in Australia or not, but uh, at least here in the States, once women have children, um, then uh, the music industry is a little less interested in them. And yeah. so Mama Palooza is, is trying to help women get out from being in that marginalized kind of uh, thought process with the music industry and, and give women an opportunity to take the stage and, and really shine. So those are the two organizations I've worked with. That's great. So you... you teaching at the moment, working at home, you have a studio. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what else are you doing at the moment? Um, so, uh, you mean musically? So, uh, okay. yeah. yeah. As well as um, you're te obviously you're teaching at home, is that correct? In yeah, I have a, right now? Yeah. yeah, I've got a few students that I teach, uh, a combination of voice and guitar and, um, and performance and then uh, doing a little bit of production work with some different people and uh, just really, you know, my role in production is to help, uh, like Leon, my husband does all the arranging and I help the artist with their voice um, in terms of how to get the best vocal performance during the recording and then also help them with their sound, help them uh, really try to come up with a unique identifiable sound that uh, doesn't sound like everybody else that's on the radio so that they have their own signature. Um, yeah, that, that's, great. That's, that's a really important part for a young musician to learn, I think. Yeah. Is, is, is to, I mean, I think it's important for them to have mentors and people that they want to sound like, but eventually you need, need to find your own voice. And as Miles Davis said, that could take a lifetime. Yeah, it can. What What's the best advice you've ever received, Cheryl? You know, the Music. best, yeah, or the life. best, or life advice. You know, yeah. um, there's there's a, a publisher in Nashville uh, who I became friends with several years ago, and he told me, uh, you have to do one thing for your dream each day. You know, if you just do one thing, uh, You'll, you'll progress, you get a little further. Yeah, yeah that's, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So what's next for Cheryl Page? Uh, next for Cheryl Page is that uh, album project that I was mentioning, the collaborative project where I'm going to bring in all the fantastic musicians that I know uh, to play uh, duos with me and, you know, be kind of the band and uh, what I would love to do uh, when I get that project done is uh, there's a performing arts center here locally so I want to take that that show and do it at the performing arts center and uh, do a big fundraiser for a local charity and um, you know that would be uh, that would be my next step that's what I want to do great well, yep. I think we've got some questions ready uh, ben? Okay. Um, we have a question from Brian. Um, uh, the partial capos that you were demonstrating, are those commercially available? Yeah, they are. So you can get these at, uh, you can get them online at any of the online music stores like uh, Musician's Friend or Sweetwater. Um, or you could probably just go into your local guitar center or, I mean, I don't know which uh, stores you have available there. So, but this is just called a half capo. And I don't know if you can see it really well, but it's just a little teeny three string capo. And this is a standard capo, just a standard capo. And the, you know, there's just so many really cool things you can do with them. So like another tuning, I'll show you. So here's one where I do a, a drop D, and let's see, I do um, half capo at the fourth fret, and then I do a full capo here. So here I'm putting the full capo. 
It's covering everything on the second fret except for the first string. Now I'm going to add this half capo on that fourth fret. shapes there. It's really interesting sounds. Um, but yeah, you can, so like multiple capos together you can play with. Um, but usually the easiest thing is just experiment with them um, like two, uh, like two frets apart and uh, just experiment and see what sounds good to you and play standard chords and uh, you just come up with some really nice things. Yeah, I guess the, the trick also would be to remember what where you had the capo if you yeah. write a song. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, probably you know, what you're looking at, you have a little a little list there of tunings and... I and do, I've, I've got my list of tunings and, and when I write a song I always write uh, on the top of the piece of paper what capo I'm placing where, what the tuning is, yeah. so that uh, I can come back to it, you know, because otherwise I can easily forget. Exactly. And there's nothing worse than playing with the band <laughs> and the capo on the wrong spot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Do we have any more questions, Ben? Uh, another one from Brian is that um, with those uh, partial capos, can people make them themselves by, I guess, modifying um, standard capos? You can. Uh, so you could take a standard capo and uh, you can uh, get a hacksaw and just hack out different places in it. And, uh, and that will give you sort of the, the same effect. So, um, and actually, one of the things, I haven't done it with this because this particular capo allows me to just do five strings at a time. But um, sometimes it, it doesn't work that way with every capo. There's slight differences in the manufacturing. And so uh, what you can do is just get a hacksaw and cut off the very end of it so that you could have your five string capo um, or a three string capo. So you can you can play with them, do different things. The Kaiser capos work really well uh, for that, just for that reason because, like you can see the the different lengths here. One's really short, one's a little bit longer, and you can you, you can chop them off at the end and they'll still work. I know there's capos available too. Sure, you may or may not have seen them that have six little buttons. That you yep. can actually, they come out or in, so you could have, you know, it's perhaps at the third fret on the E string and then the yep. uh, third fret on the D string mm -hmm. and leaving yep. all the other strings open. So yep. they're, 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 quite, um, they're quite amazing actually to experiment with. So that's, a, that's another caper that I'm sure you can buy online or at your local shop. Yep. Yeah, those, those are good ones. And... Uh, what I love about these are that they're so quick. Um, so, you know, Joni Mitchell clearly is probably the the alternate tuning uh, queen. You know, I mean, she's the person that uses alternate tunings the most. And when she performs, she's got a whole set of guitars up on stage that are tuned to different tunings. And the beauty of using the capos to achieve tunings is that you don't have to retune your guitar. You just uh, throw a couple of capos on in different configurations, and you can achieve tunings, and your guitar stays relatively in tune. And so it's very quick. So I'll I'll use probably three, four, five different tunings when I'm doing an hour set of music, and it's just capo on, capo off, capo in a different position. Very very quick to adjust. Yeah. Yeah, that's something you get used to working with. Any more questions, Ben? Uh, we have an email from Sammy. Um, what's your favorite guitar or guitars to use? 
Um, and how would you recommend choosing a guitar that's going to last you a lifetime? Oh, well, a guitar that's going to last a lifetime, you want to pick a guitar that's made from really good wood and is handcrafted as much as possible. Um, and uh, so guitars I really like. Uh, I travel to Nashville quite a bit, and I get to play different guitars a lot. Um, and there are a few, there are f I mean, there are so many that I really like. Um, the, the Taylor guitars are very consistent. Um, they're consistently made and consistently crafted. They're great guitars. Um, this guitar is an Alvarez Yari guitar that was made in the 1980s. It was made in 1982. And um, it's made of rosewood. And it's just got really beautiful warm tone. So I love this particular guitar. The, the more recent uh, Alvarez guitars are not as nice as the older ones. So, uh, but I, I lucked out with this one. And, you know, Martin guitars are fantastic. They've got great tone. A lot of people in bluegrass music use them. Um, you know, there are some guitars made in Canada that are really fantastic. I'm trying to remember the name of them, like Seagull or something like that. But um, anyway, you want to listen for tone. Uh, you know, some guitars have a brighter tone and some have a deeper, rich tone. And if you get a guitar with great wood, it's just going to mellow and get richer with age. So you want to look for great wood uh, in your guitar and great craftsmanship in it. Um, and so it'll mean it'll probably be on the little bit more expensive side when you purchase a guitar, but it's worth the investment because it'll stay with you for a lifetime and uh, you know it'll be a great companion, help you express your art. That's right. I think an important factor there too is to play the guitar. Because guitars are made yeah. to be played. They don't get yeah. better if they're not played. Exactly. Uh, the, wood, the wood responds to the tone, and I think the guitars actually respond to their owners as well. So mm -hmm. That's a big part. Of the personality goes into the sound of the guitar. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Yeah, you need to invest um, thousands of dollars, pretty much, to have a real fine guitar that's going to last you, last you a lifetime. And that's yeah. nothing when you compare it to a car that you pretty much got to get rid of within 10 years that you could spend right. thirty, forty thousand dollars on. Um, right, but if exactly. If you spend that on a guitar, you've got it forever. Mm -hmm. I, I remember showing my father a guitar that I bought, and I told him how much it cost, and he said, "You could have bought a car with that." Yeah. <laughs> my answer to that was, "But I will have this when I die. I won't have the car." That's so right. It, it yeah. Very much is an investment, and if you work, if you you know, if you spent five thousand dollars on a guitar and you lived for forty years, that's a pretty good investment. Mm -hmm. So, any more questions, Ben? Um, we have another question from Fret Math. Um, uh, are there, are the chord charts or are the charts available for those capo positions that you were playing earlier on, Cheryl? Yeah. So, uh, in I think in the um, it's on the blog maybe. Yeah, there's, the documents uh, are available on the blog. Yeah, yeah. there's some, um, yeah. you know, the positionings for the, the capo, you know, the capo positionings. And then, uh, like I was saying earlier, I just play standard chords. So you just try those capo positionings out and play your standard shapes, and uh, you'll have fun with them. Uh, there, there are some shapes um, that are actually kind of a little different. I, I call them single string tunings. So like if you were to take So I just took my uh, third string and I dropped it a step. So this, that's actually called loop tuning. Uh, so I had to learn a classical piece one time and it, would, it used loop tuning. And so uh, the thing that's really interesting about this is that um, if you've ever heard a baritone guitar, they have this deep, rich sound to them. And uh, you can accomplish the same thing on a standard guitar by just using loop tuning. Um, and what you do is all of your chord shapes move over one string. So uh, like your E shape, you'd play down here. Let me 
ചിന്നര guitar gives you and that just opens up uh, your playing and writing to some different possibilities with that uh, so that that's another single string thing that you can do Great. and we have one more email from Mike um, so Cheryl's been a finalist in a couple of songwriting competitions mm -hmm. um, has that exposure been helpful and would you recommend those competitions to new songwriters? Yeah, I think the competitions are really great for a couple of different reasons. Um, so in, in the competitions, you have the opportunity to, many of them will allow you to send music in and they'll give you feedback. Um, and depending on the competition, you're either, you're either getting feedback on how commercially viable is what you're writing, um, or you're getting feedback regarding how uh, on target is what you're writing for this particular niche that you're trying to aim for. So like if you're submitting to singer-songwriter competitions, um, then what they're generally looking for is music that connects on an emotional level and on an intellectual level and sounds really interesting and really grabs somebody. And so if you are able to, you know, make your way up into that competition and perform in the competition, you'll have the opportunity to meet with, you know, some really great songwriters that you may never have had the, the chance to meet with before. So I highly recommend uh, getting involved in competitions. Um, and, you know, when you've actually achieved, you know, like a, an award in one of the competitions, then it'll open up doors for you that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So, um, you know, I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, sometimes people's music is just so absolutely unique and in a class by itself that, um, you know, it might not fit for the competitions that are out there. So don't just throw your money away on a competition that you wouldn't necessarily be a good fit for. Listen to what's being submitted uh, from previous years and what has won and find one that you're a good fit for, you know, and try to connect with that community and learn from the people that are in that community. So I think it's a worthwhile thing. Yeah, that's a good answer. Well, I think that's it for this week, Cheryl. It's been a real pleasure right. having you on the show. It's been great um, to hang out with you, Dave. Yeah, it's been good. Uh, yeah. Perhaps when I've finished uh, saying goodbye, you could just play us a little bit more of something that you sure. have uh, with the yeah. cameras. Yeah, I will do that. So, do. Great. Next week, uh, our guest will be Rob Pippin. He's uh, an Adelaide guitarist, musical director, songwriter. He's been uh, performing around Adelaide and Australia for about 27 years. So he's going to come on the show and talk to us about uh, creating lead guitar leaks basically using, using um, backing tracks and other ways of developing your lead guitar skills. And don't forget you can continue the conversation on our blog. Uh, so same time, uh, same place on the music space next week. See you then. Cheryl? Okay. <coughs>